as the sperm penetrates. So there's a whole bunch of sperm that actually reach the ovum. Remember that for every ejaculation, there's anywhere from 50 to 500 million sperm that get released. So that means a whole bunch of sperm can actually reach the ovum. So once they do reach the ovum, and let's actually write secondary oocyte here because that's actually a more correct term. So when the secondary or when the sperm reach the secondary oocyte, this is when the acrosomal reaction begins. So the acrosomal reaction begins where a whole bunch of enzymes get released and the enzymes start breaking through the zona pellucida. And so here you can see in step two, all right, the enzymes that are being released. So you can see how that red area is indicating that. And then we have step three breaking through the zona pellucida. Okay, because remember these have to penetrate into the egg. So now, sperm have gained entry into your secondary oocyte. And once they've gained entry into the secondary oocyte, the first sperm to bind to the receptor on the oocyte wins. That's the one that fertilizes the egg. Okay, it's gotta bind to the receptor, however. Once that happens, the sperm can get transported to the cytoplasm of the oocyte and then the zona pellucida will harden and that prevents what's called polyspermy. So you don't want multiple sperm fertilizing eggs. This picture will look familiar to you once again. So now where we are in this diagram, remember this was the diagram of oogenesis, we are at this level here after fertilization now. So that is stimulated meiosis two. Fertilization stimulates meiosis two. That's where then we go from a secondary oocyte to an ovum. So the sperm plasma membrane then disintegrates. The chromosomes from the sperm and from the ovum migrate to the center. And now we have a zygote. So from that fertilized egg then, the zygote is gonna start developing. So remember where we are, we're in the uterine tube. Here's the zygote, which is the fertilized ovum. Now that zygote is gonna undergo mitosis. And when it undergoes mitosis, the result is a four cell stage. Then it's gonna undergo mitosis again, all right? And then it will become a morula. So a morula is literally a solid ball of cells. If you look at this image, it's nothing more than a solid ball of cells. That morula then, will undergo more development and it will develop into a blastocyst. A blastocyst is essentially a hollow ball of cells. Here's a little area that's got some cells and the rest of this, the blastocyst is actually hollow. The tropoblast will actually, it'll eventually become the placenta or help form part of the placenta at least. It's at this time that that blastocyst becomes an actual embryo. So with the blastocyst, the reason we're saying that this becomes an embryo is that the cells begin to differentiate. And what I mean by the cells beginning to differentiate is that they're now committed to becoming certain types of tissues. Maybe they're committed to becoming neural tissue or maybe they're committed to becoming muscle tissue and so on. Then finally, here we have implantation at day six post-fertilization. And the trophoblast is also very important or plays a role in implantation. Okay, so a lot of times we get the question, well, how, how are twins derived, okay? So if you get identical twins, what's happened with identical twins is that the morula that we talked about on the previous slide, the morula splits. And when the morula splits, you wind up with two different embryos. So you have identical twins. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, is where you actually have two different eggs that are fertilized by two different sperm. So those are fraternal twins. So now we have the blastocyst. So the blastocyst will begin the process of implantation. Okay, so we're in the uterus and the blastocyst is gonna start to implant. So first off, the endometrium, it swells and that increases, and it increases glycogen stores. Why do you think we're gonna need glycogen? Why is that important? Continuing on with this process of implantation, 
the trophoblast starts secreting enzymes, and that's going to start dissolving away the wall of the endometrium. This is showing how the enzymes are eating away at that part of the wall. We're digesting the cells and we're providing nourishment for the embryo. At the same time, there's also paracrines that are secreted. And so what that's going to do is it's going to increase the capillaries in the area so that way you can bring more oxygen and nutrient delivered to the area. You can also then remove more carbon dioxide and remove waste from the area as well. In late embryonic development, so at three weeks, you can see what the embryo looks like at three weeks. You can see what the embryo looks like at five weeks. You can make a comparison there. At five weeks, the trophoblast actually thickens. And when the trophoblast thickens, it becomes a co the chorion, and the chorion encapsulates the embryo. All right, and then by eight weeks, now we have what we call a little human, right? And now this thing resembles a human, and now it's appropriate to call it a fetus. So at this time, by eight weeks, the placenta has developed. We're not going to go into details on the exact physiology of the placenta, but the placenta is allowing for exchange of gases and nutrients between the fetus and the mother. Okay, so it's between the circulation of the fetus and the circulation of the mother. Or you could say maternal all right, maternal and fetal circulation. During sexual intercourse, about 300 million sperm enter the vagina. Soon afterward, millions of them will either flow out of the vagina or die in its acidic environment. However, many survive because of the protective elements provided in the fluid surrounding them. Next, the sperm must pass through the cervix, an opening into the uterus. Usually, it remains tightly closed, but here the cervix is open for a few days while the woman ovulates. The sperm swim through the cervical mucus, which is thinned to a more watery consistency for easier passage. Once inside the cervix, the sperm continues swimming toward the uterus, though millions will die trying to make it through the mucus. Some sperm remain behind, caught in the folds of the cervix, but they may later continue the journey as a backup to the first group. Inside the uterus, muscular uterine contractions assist the sperm on their journey toward the egg. However, resident cells from the woman's immune system mistaking the sperm for foreign invaders, destroy thousands more. Next, half the sperm head for the empty fallopian tube, while the other half swim toward the tube containing the unfertilized egg. Now, only a few thousand remain. Inside the fallopian tube, tiny cilia push the egg toward the uterus. To continue, the sperm must surge against this motion to reach the egg. Some sperm get trapped in the cilia and die. During this part of the journey, chemicals in the reproductive tract cause the membranes covering the heads of the sperm to change. As a result, the sperm become hyperactive, swimming harder and faster toward their destination. At long last, the sperm reach the egg. Only a few dozen of the original 300 million sperm remain. The egg is covered with a layer of cells called the corona radiata. The sperm must push through this layer to reach the outer layer of the egg, the zona pellucida. When sperm reach the zona pellucida, they attach to specialized sperm receptors on the surface, which triggers their acrosomes to release digestive enzymes enabling the sperm to burrow into the layer. Inside the zona pellucida is a narrow, fluid-filled space just outside the egg cell membrane. The first sperm to make contact will fertilize the egg. After a perilous journey and against incredible odds, a single sperm attaches to the egg cell membrane. Within a few minutes, 
their outer membranes fuse and the egg pulls the sperm inside. This event causes changes in the egg membrane that prevent other sperm from attaching to it. Next, the egg releases chemicals that push other sperm away from the egg and create an impenetrable fertilization membrane. As the reaction spreads outward, the zona pellucida hardens, trapping any sperm unlucky enough to be caught inside. Outside the egg, sperm are no longer able to attach to the zona pellucida. Meanwhile, inside the egg, the tightly packed male genetic material spreads out. A new membrane forms around the genetic material, creating the male pronucleus. Inside, the genetic material reforms into 23 chromosomes. The female genetic material, awakened by the fusion of the sperm with the egg, finishes dividing, resulting in the female pronucleus, which also contains 23 chromosomes. As the male and female pronuclei form, spiderweb-like threads, called microtubules, pull them toward each other. The two sets of chromosomes join together, completing the process of fertilization. At this moment, a unique genetic code arises, instantly determining gender, hair color, eye color, and hundreds of other characteristics. This new single cell, the zygote, is the beginning of a new human being. And now the cilia in the fallopian tube gently sweep the zygote toward the uterus, where he or she will implant in the rich uterine lining, growing and maturing for the next nine months until ready for birth. <laughs>